So let, let, let me um, let me take this back to the to the claim itself here. Um, at what point in the in the story that we know or that we've been told? At what point is the hoax involved? Were the rockets ever sent up? If they were sent up, were they just not sent to the moon? With were, were there no astronauts on board? Where, where does the line between, uh, you know, what we know to be fact versus what we are con, uh, contesting here? Uh, yeah, a good question. Very interesting question because it it's it shows up what actually happened. Now, most people, if they're around at the time or have seen films since, will remember seeing film of the, of the Saturn V rockets taking off. Those were totally real. Those did take off. Where they went to, two minutes after they launched, we have to rely on NASA to tell us, because there's, that is the only source of information. The rockets certainly were launched, and after two minutes, the first stage was jettisoned and fell into the Atlantic, and Jeff Bezos has actually recovered the engines that were used in that launch was recovered one of the engines because all the all the Saturn V rockets were launched over the Atlantic towards Africa and they would then circle the earth for about an hour and a half it takes an hour and a half to circle the earth and then they would launch from there they would launch into what's called lunar trans lunar injection they would fire the rocket again or fire the third stage of the rocket to get it fast enough because in order to leave Earth's gravity you have to accelerate up to 25,000 miles an hour. If you're in Earth orbit you're doing 17,500 miles an hour. That's why it stays in Earth orbit and doesn't go off to the moon. If you're going to go to the moon or any rocket that leaves Earth's gravitational field has to accelerate to 25,000 miles an hour which requires a considerable amount of fuel to do it albeit there isn't the air resistance you'll get in the lower atmosphere. And we'll, we'll come back to the atmosphere and how that affects the returning craft later, possibly. So after the launch, two minutes after the launch, the rocket disappears from view, and we have to rely on NASA to tell us what happened until we see it coming back down to Earth on its three parachutes, in the case of Apollo 11, eight, uh, eight days after the launch. The astronauts were picked up from the Pacific with President Nixon watching and they were then flown back to Houston to go into quarantine for three weeks. Now, where the rocket went, we have to rely on NASA to tell us. Did it go to the moon? Well, most people will say, of course it went to the moon. I saw the TV pictures of they were walking around on the lunar surface. How could that not be true? Well, I've seen 80-foot gorillas climb the Empire State Building. Is that real? <laughs> I've, I've seen dinosaurs chasing kids around kitchens in, in Jurassic Park. Very persuasive. We know it's not real because we know it's a film. But Apollo is presented as fact, as documentary evidence. In fact, there was a very good film made called First Man released uh, a few months ago, which I saw on the IMAX, the IMAX screen over here in, uh, in the UK. And it's a very, very professional piece of Hollywood filmmaking. Hollywood can do an amazing amount of, uh, not deception, because we know what we're watching. You know, we're, uh, when we watch 2001 A Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick's great masterpiece, we know we're watching a film, and these are models, that we're prepared to suspend our disbelief and consider that it might be on its way to Jupiter. Now Apollo, we're told, went to the moon and we've seen the pictures of the astronauts on the moon. We've seen the 5,771 photographs taken on the lunar surface by all the Apollo missions. How can it not be real? How can it not be true? Very easily. If we go back a little bit to the beginning of the Apollo program, which was the uh, announced by uh, President John Kennedy in May 1961, purely as a political statement following the orbit of the Earth by Yuri Gagarin from the Soviet Union, 
President Kennedy, who'd only been in office for about four months at that point, and he'd already had to deal with the Bay of Pigs fiasco, he had to do something to show that America were going to be, if not the leaders, in space travel. We're going to land a man on the moon before the decade is out and return him to the Earth. That was his challenge. Nobody at that time in America had even been into orbit. Alan Shepard had been up in the uh, rocket and come straight back down again. It wasn't even an orbital flight. That was John Glenn about a year later. So America didn't actually know if they could do it. But the challenge was there. And in November 1963, we all know what happened to John Kennedy. So the martyred president's challenge had to be met. And this was the mission that, that Apollo was going to fulfill. Now, 400,000 people worked on the Apollo program at the height of the uh, activity in about 1965. They were doing the very best job they could. They were building the best rockets they could, the best landers they could, the best control centers they could, the best spacesuits. They were doing whatever they were asked to do. They didn't know of any deception. Nobody knew of any deception at that time, except possibly a few people at the head of NASA, who at some point in the mid-1960s, probably around the time of the disastrous events of Apollo 1, where three astronauts were killed when their spacecraft, which was being tested on Earth, exploded as a result of pressurized oxygen, which was filling the spacecraft. Anybody knows that if you put oxygen under pressure and then put a light, a, an ignition source in it, it's going to explode. It's called a calorific bomb. And at that point, the Apollo program was virtually stopped. But they only had another three years to get to the moon, from January 1967 to the end of 1969. Were they going to be able to do it? Or were they going to have to have a plan B, a backup? Because one of the other points, which is quite often overlooked, though it's very obvious when you think about it, that all the Apollo missions were going to be live on television. Live on television. The one thing that NASA did not want to happen, or certainly nobody wanted to happen, was to see an astronaut die live on television. Right. So they had to make sure that it didn't happen. So was there a backup plan? that could be shown as if the missions were for real. Because there is a very severe danger in traveling to the moon. It's called radiation. About 500 miles above the Earth's surface starts what's called, or what's known as now, the Van Allen radiation belts, named after Professor James Van Allen of Iowa University, who first identified them. By the simple expedient of putting a Geiger counter on top of a rocket, sending it up and seeing what the readings were. And as they said at the time, my God, space is radioactive. <laughs> because the readings of the Geiger counter were so severe that it would almost certainly be lethal to any unprotected human traveling through them. So I then looked, was the sufficient radiation protection in the spacecraft? Answer, no. Did they have any radiation protection in their spacesuits when they walked around on the lunar surface? Answer, no. So wh what was going on here? How were these? And if you've seen the, uh, the recent test of the Orion capsule, which is Apollo 2.0, the Orion capsule was sent out in December 2014, about 5,000 miles out, on its first test, and then it was brought back, and there's a film where a NASA engineer says, As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection, 
Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Well, why don't you just use what you used on Apollo? It seemed to be pretty successful then. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good point. Has anybody uh, ever put that question to a NASA official and gotten a, a satisfactory answer? When the question is asked, how were these astronauts protected in the high levels of radiation of space? What, have we got an answer to that at all? Uh, basically, they went through them so fast it didn't affect them. Ah. Uh. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, some of the evidence that might support uh, the idea that this, the Apollo missions did not happen as they were portrayed. Um, we haven't talked a lot about motivation. Let's take the next couple minutes and talk about the motivation of faking such uh, a monumental hoax. Uh, why would NASA or the U.S. government, or anybody for that matter, want to fake something of this magnitude? That's a very good question, and it's... Uh basically you need, to, you need to look at the Apollo program in the context of its time. This is the 1960s, where we have the Cold War going on between the Soviet Union and the United States. We have the Vietnam War ramping up from the mid-1960s onwards, with horrific images coming through. We have the space race going on, where the United States need to demonstrate their technical superiority. Apollo was the good news in a decade of assassinations and disaster and social unrest. The civil rights movement was also in full swing. There was a great deal of bad news. Apollo was going to be the good news. And it was because it was successful, or it appeared to be, it was presented as being successful. It was perfectly possible to recreate all the Apollo images here on Earth, and in fact that was done. All the missions were simulated, there was a lot of training took place, none of it secret, everybody knew what was going on. In fact, there's a full-scale replica of the Sea of Tranquility where Apollo 11 landed at Cinder Lake outside Flagstaff in Arizona. You can go and see it today. There are also models made, large models. A lot of simulation, a lot of training was done, therefore, it would be perfectly possible to film the whole thing here on Earth. And I contend that that was what was done, but presented as being shown live from the moon. Now we then have to ask the question, what power would be required to transmit a television picture live from the moon to the Earth? 240,000 miles. And most people will say, well, you just point it in the right direction and you pick it up here on Earth. There's nothing to stop the picture coming through. Well, there's 240,000 miles of space and you do get a loss of power over that distance. You then get the atmosphere it has to travel through. It has to be collected by a big receiver and the only one that did it for Apollo 11 was based in Australia at Honeysuckle Creek. There were three other receivers in, in California and in Spain so that the whole thing could be recorded as it happened. But was it being recorded from the moon, or was it here on Earth and being transmitted through a very complex computer system? People really want to believe that this happened. Because if they're American, as uh, obviously many of your listeners will be, this is almost part of American culture. So how can some Brit come along and challenge it. I mean, it doesn't make sense, really, does it? Or maybe it does, because somebody outside the emotional bubble which NASA has built around the Apollo missions may well be able to look more dispassionately at it, and I hope that's what I can do. And in fact, there's been a considerable amount of research recently. There are two new books just been published They're on Amazon, one is called The Apollo Missions, Hiding a Hoax in Plain Sight, Part 1. Now that's by a Canadian author called Randy Walsh. But his book is extremely interesting because he is a commercial pilot. So he knows about how to navigate across distances, which is what the Apollo missions did coming back from the moon. It's not simple as saying, well, there's the Earth, we'll just go for it. Because the Earth is moving in relation to the Apollo craft in this case.
So did they have the computing power to be able to navigate across 240,000 miles of space? If you're navigating an aircraft, you use radio beacons. You don't fly by uh, following a river, or not anymore, you used to back in the 1920s. You don't follow by landmarks, you follow by extremely sophisticated navigational equipment. But Apollo didn't have any of this. The computing power on Apollo was, was almost minuscule compared to what you carry around in a, with a smartphone today. 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 Today.